Hello, everybody. Nelson Virgil here from ExcelMail.com, uh, DiscountLabs.com. And today, I haven't done a video in a while, guys. You know that. But um, I could not help myself. Um, saw Dr. Rubin on one of her videos uh, maybe a few months ago. And I just, I just said, I need to meet this woman. This, she's she's out, out there, not only educating men and women about sexual health and medicine, but also physicians, um, actually advocating not only for better training of physicians on topics that are usually voodoo and nobody wants to talk about, but all of us are suffering, as, as all of you know, men and women uh, in my network. So I am so happy to have her. She, she was gracious enough. She's on vacation. She has two kids. She's taking care of her family. So guys, let's just... Um, Let's just be just lucky that we have her. Dr. Uh, Ruben is a board certified urologist. So she's a urologist and one of the handful uh, of physicians with a fellowship training in sexual medicine for all genders, not only men and women, but both genders. And she's a clinician, a researcher, a passionate educator. You're going to see what I mean. And a mom of two. Uh, in addition to being an educator, uh, chair of the International Society of Stu uh, Study of Women's Health, she serves as, a, as an associate editor of the Sexual Medicine Reviews Journal. She's completed her medical education at Tufts University, very good school, her urology training at Georgetown University, and her sexual fellowship training with Dr. Goldstein in San Diego. So welcome, uh, Dr. Rubin, and thank you so much. I know you're like booked till January, so I'm-, I'm No, <laughs> thank you. We love to, we, we, we want to help as many people as possible. And thank you for having me. I am hot spotted uh, from the woods of North Carolina, so I hope we have good connection here, but uh, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to talk with you. No, no, I mean, great, grateful we all are. So listen, we, we don't have much time. It's going to be a short, like 30 minutes. And I think you hopefully will not give me a little bit more. But today I want to concentrate not on the science of things as much as the advocacy. Uh, patients like me, I'm, you know, a male, being on testosterone forever, being on all kinds of stuff, HIV positive for 40 years. I have dealt with medical establishment. I have a group of uh, women, over 10,000 women on Facebook, women's uh, HR, health and HRT is a group. And there's so much frustration there for the lack of knowledge on doctors, doctors that people are seeing or trying to find a doctor actually gets to see them. So tell us, um, um, what are you doing when it comes to not only educating, because you are all over the internet on YouTube and in podcasts, but physicians themselves to help, uh, help educate uh, doctors on sexual health for men and women. Yeah, so it's a uh, it's a big problem, right? Because we uh, sexual medicine for men is about twenty years ahead of sexual medicine for women. In fact, it was uh, Viagra, which came out in nineteen ninety eight, which my mentor was the first author in the New England Journal of Medicine on that paper. And what happened was women started calling his office and say, Dr. Goldstein, what do you got for me? And he was like, I don't have anything for you. And it was around the time his wife was going through menopause. And he said, it was 1998. He said, why is there nothing for women? And so he created it. Talk about advocacy. He created the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health or ISWSH, I-S-S-W-S-H. Uh, and you can find providers on their website. And so he created this organization in 1998. And now we've had men's sexual health for many, many years before that. So it's, we're about 20 years behind. And so it's incredibly frustrating because we didn't learn it in medical school. We didn't get that education. In fact, you know, men's sexual health wasn't so talked about until we had options and treatments like Viagra uh, and things like that. And so it's an evolving uh, a field, but it, that's what makes it so incredible and so much fun. Here, here I am, I do have a lot of gray hair, I promise, um, but I'm relatively young in my career, right? I have a baby face. And so I can be someone in this field because it's wide open, because there's so much we don't know. And I'm strong enough as a doctor, I think actually one of my qualities as a doctor that makes me good is I'm okay to say, we don't know. We're in a data-free zone. We don't have data for that, but we want data for that. And so I, my advocacy work is in demanding data for that to saying no longer can we just say, well, here, take all these supplements that don't have any data behind them. I want to see data. I want to see evidence. And so we have to advocate because the NIH is not pushing billions of dollars into women's sexual health research. And, and how do we, how do we, how do we uh, mobilize uh, not only women, obviously men, because every time, you know, a man gets on, let's, let's say hormones or Viagra, things tend to improve. 
There needs and, to be a uh, place for their penises to go, right? Like, <laughs> say what it is, right? They need a place to put the penises. And so it, it's a huge problem, right? It's a, and, and so what's so frustrating is we raise children to talk about genital as though they are private parts, right? Private parts, we don't talk about them, which unfortunately now they're private parts to you as well. You go to the gynecologist, we hide under the sheet like we're mechanics. We don't want you to see what we're looking at. We don't want you to feel embarrassed about your own genitalia. Women are always apologizing. Oh, I'm sorry. It smells. I'm sorry. I didn't shave. I'm sorry. I'm on my period. And you say, what do you mean? This is a body part. If you had a bloody nose, would you apologize to the ENT, right? If you had a broken arm, would you apologize to the orthopedic surgeon? There is something so inherently we train people to be dis disgusted by their own body parts. And so we don't talk about it. We don't research it. We don't give treatments that are helpful because we're also embarrassed. People are embarrassed uh, to talk about sex with the people they're having sex with. And I think the difference in what I do is I talk about it like it's high blood pressure and diabetes, right? It's not, I take the sex out of it and talk about it like it's biology and physiology and pleasure and orgasm is a reflex that feels good. So how can we maximize your quality of life? And you deserve deserve it. In women's health, we don't often teach women that they deserve a quality of life, which we can go into. How do we mobilize? We have unlimited work to do. It can't just be me yelling and screaming. And so we must inspire the next generation. We must teach the current providers that are out there and the doctors that are out there how to do this. Because the problem is there are a lot of people who want to take your money there are a lot of people who want to offer you these big packages of these things that are like these things that have no evidence behind them because it's the easy way out. It's easy to make a buck off of you, but it's not easy to do research. It's not easy to do a clinical trial. And we don't demand it of our drug companies. We don't demand it of the NIH. And so we let the snake oil salesmen take over. And it's a huge problem. Um, so I wish one day whoever's listening who wants to endow me a fellowship so I can train everyone we only have one fellowship in the country that acknowledges women's sexual health. Let that sink in, right? And it's my mentor, Dr. Goldstein, who trains in all genders, you know, sexual medicine. And so if we only have one fellowship and we train, there's actually no fellow this year. So we're not even training anyone this year, but there's only a handful of us who have been trained in this. You need money to do a fellowship. You need people to, you need to pay someone's salary. You need to pay health insurance. And so we need to be able to fund research. We need to be able to fund training. And so we do a lot of courses through this ASWISH organization. We have our first virtual pelvic pain course uh, going on right now. We have an in-person course every fall where we teach the basics of sexual medicine. And there's about a thousand people in this organization, which is incredible, but there needs to be a million people in this organization, right? We need, we need need so many doctors, every primary care doctor, uh, endocrinologist, um, gynecologist, urologist to understand hormones, to understand sexual health, because everything we do can affect sexual, every surgery that you can have, every medical condition you can have, it can all affect your sexual health. Wow. So, so this is the thousand people that you have as members. These are all kinds of specialties, right? That's Everything. Right. So it's physical therapists, sex therapists, um, you know, basic science researchers, endocrinologists, right? It's, it's every field. Um, and it's only about a thousand people. And those are the best a thousand people you ever met in your life. I mean, they, they are just incredible. So if you are a, a woman listening and want someone who understands sexual medicine, you can go to isswsh.org, iswish.org. That's the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. Don't say it four times fast because you won't be able to. It's a tongue twister. Um, but they have a find a provider uh, where you can search for someone in your area. And my, my dream is if your provider doesn't know this, get them to those courses. Say, hey, did you know about this? You know, this is evidence. Doctors, who live in this evidence-based world. Now, is there a lot of unknown? Of course, there's a lot of unknown, but we can't keep doing nothing, which is not acceptable, but we also can't keep letting sort of the snake oil like be the, the only thing that's happening. And so there are those a thousand of us that live in the middle who are screaming saying, hey, people deserve good orgasms, good libidos, uh, you know, good quality of life. They deserve those things. And we should try to optimize them any way that we can. That's, that's great to know. So uh, is 
is this provided online, this training, uh, or, or is this in San Diego? I was looking at Dr. Goldstein. Yeah, well, so the, the fellowship that I did was a year-long fellowship as a urologist. You go as a urologist and you go for a whole year, you do research, you do, you're a clinician. Um, now, ISWISH is, we, we do these smaller courses. So we do an in-person course in Scottsdale. It's going to be in November this year. It's three days. Um, we do a, vir right now we're doing a virtual course for uh, taking care of people with pelvic pain. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's about 200 hundred doctors who signed up uh, and, and nurse practitioners who signed up to take this course, which is really great. But I wish more than 200 people wanted to, you know, learn how to manage pelvic pain. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, but those are those are the big options for um, for trainings. But we need more. I'll include all that information in the comment section yeah. down below the, uh, the video. Um, so let's talk uh, generalities about and you can go as, as deeply as you want on this one. It's just a fun question. What are the main misconceptions about sexual health that men have about women uh, and vice versa? And vice yeah. Versa. Oh, that's easy. Oh, gosh, I could go all, I could go all day <laughs> with this one. No. And as you know, I don't do short answers, unfortunately. Um, so I think one of the biggest things that we see, right, is when a woman comes in and says, Dr. Rubin, I'm broken. I can't orgasm from penetration. Right. And you're like, well, it's the, neither can 82% of women period, like you're normal. And so it's, it's a lot of education, right? No, if you just look at Hollywood and porn, it would be like, like you think that that's normal. And so when I show, and I do this a lot, I actually take care of veterans um, at the, at our local VA hospital in Washington, DC. And these are, you know, 70 year old men, 80 year old men, amazing humans. And they come in and I show them all pictures of what a real clitoris looks like next to a real penis. And the penis and the clitoris are exactly the same. They're made up of the same tissue. They have the same erections, the same arousal. It's just that women don't penetrate with or pee through their clitoris, so nobody cares. And so I show them this and I say, okay, well, the vagina is here, right? But the clitoris lives here on top of it. I said, so Mr. Jones, if you rub the inside of your leg, are you going to have an orgasm? He looks at me like I'm crazy. He says, no, Ruben, of course I'm not going to have a... I said, no, but really pound the inside of your thigh. Go for 20 minutes now. Are you going to have an orgasm? And he's like, no, crazy lady. Of course I'm not. <laughs> well, it's close to your penis, but it's not your penis. And that, again, to, to women, to showing them, well, the vagina is close to the clitoris, but it is not the actual clitoris, right? And so it, just that education. Um, uh, oh, Art, I'm, I'm doing a uh, an interview. Okay. So, um, so really it's that education is really important to teach people just basic anatomy of what is, you know, what is happening where. And so it goes for both genders. I love that I can teach men about female body parts and females about male body parts. For example, erectile dysfunction, we call it the canary in a coal mine, right? If you're a young guy and you're having erection problems, uh, it's a huge issue and it could mean cardiovascular issues. It could mean that you're five, 10 years away from a heart attack because if you're already clogging your small pipes and no matter how big your penis is the arteries going to it are pretty small if those are clogging that could mean your heart arteries are going to clog down the road and so teaching people that it's not honey do you need this viagra because you're not attracted to me it's oh honey go take your muscle relaxer because your diet diabetes is making your penis not work as well. And let's go get busy and have fun. Um, and, you know, so I think that education and those misnomers, also the idea that toys or devices are somehow make you less of a good partner, I think is one of the most ridiculous concepts in the world, right? I, my iPhone doesn't make me a less good uh, doctor because now I can Google things and, you know, and learn more about my patients and, and sex technology is just revolutionized. It's so good now compared to how it was when we were growing up. Why wouldn't we add technology into the bedroom? Like, why wouldn't we want more orgasms, better orgasms, more reliable orgasms for all genders? I mean, it just to me is, is uh, just getting people to talk about it and getting them to bring that into the bedroom is, is a huge barrier sometimes. Oh, it's huge. And we have hardly any sex education in high school. And actually, it's been blocked in many states, which is, in fact, and all that shame associated with it. Don't tell me I can go on forever. I'm a gay man. Obviously, we've had a lot to um, overcome. Thank God we've overcome more than than most. But it, uh, women and men, we're just uh, the shame and the situations of not even knowing 
And, and to your point about being a gay man, right, is, is you, you know, in, in some ways, gay men actually are better at communicating with each other because they've had to, because there were no scripts, there were no movies, there was nothing that was like, this is how it should look. So you had to learn, well, what do we want it to look like? What are the rules? How do we want this to work? You have conversations about it. Whereas sometimes you get these straight people who never learn, never ask, never have any education, and they just assume that penetration is the only way to have sex. And then they'll have sex the same way every time for you know, 30 years and just assume that that's normal. And then bodies change. Erections stop working, vaginas can get dry and painful, you know, all sorts of things, and they don't talk about it. So then they just stop having sex because that's the easiest thing to do. It's just, we don't want to talk about it. So we're just gonna stop doing this. So maybe he goes to porn or she goes to you know uh, her romance novels and they have a rich sex life with themselves, which there's nothing wrong with that, mm -hmm. but it may not be sort of what they ultimately wanted. That is so frank. You you can tell us it is. I have to say that's why I'm talking to you. Something else, uh, just to uh, and I know you you have a family member waiting for you. Um, I wanted to say something. I'm learning a lot from the UK. You know, I have this false um, um, notion, and I'm an American. I've been here forever. That we are ahead of the game for everything. Obviously, not on sexual health, uh, although we do have more access here due to telehealth and telemedicine. And there's a lot of, you know, stuff like that happening right now, especially uh, like you say, a lot of uh, snake oil that are expensive too. But anyways, in the UK, there's a movement. There's actually now an over-the-counter uh, vaginal est estrogen. And you've talked a lot about that in your videos. I've watched that. I was like, how did the UK get away with this? So can you, have you followed? Yeah, what's, what's happening, happening in the, yes. And what's happening in the UK right now is incredible. And I talk about it a lot because, and I've actually made a lot of connections with incredible doctors out there who are doing amazing things. Basically what happened and what needs to happen in America is a few journalists and uh, famous people, like famous actresses, started going through menopause and literally stood there and said, what the fuck is happening right now? Why is this, excuse my language, but what <laughs> in the hell is, what in the hell is happening? Why did nobody warn me about what was gonna happen? Why is this a thing? Why is there no information? I'm a very smart, very rich, very capable person. <laughs> and so they started, uh, mobilizing. And basically what happened is there was a big documentary that came out in the, in the UK, everybody watched it. And all these women were like, what the hell? And so they started rallying and getting mad and getting and demanding uh, there to be change. And then COVID hit and all of the access to the hormones started to disappear because now there was a need. Everyone wanted it. So there were shortages of uh, getting hormone therapy. And so women started uh, completely rallying together to the point where the parliament had to uh, um, uh get somebody that they called the hormone czar, or the HRT czar, to kind of figure out why are there shortages happening. And so um, by no means, they still have plenty of ways to go in Great Britain too. They have many limitations as well, just like us in terms of having uh, approved testosterone products for women, um, which actually they had at one point an approved testosterone product, but it got stop being on the market because there was no, because it wasn't covered by their health, their national health insurance. So nobody used it. And so it was a market failure. So the company just withdrew it. So that don't get me started, but basically there became more interest in menopause. And so you have this incredible group of women and providers who are and patients and journalists who have kind of all come together. We don't yet have that in the United States. And I think partially is because everyone is trying to make a buck. Everyone is starting their own platform where they say, come do my thing. And I'm going to do these supplements and these, uh, you know, uh, wellness things and these yoga videos and these breathing and all of this stuff. And so because everyone's sort of out to do their own thing, nobody's organizing a giant push to like educate women and give good evidence-based information. Now, the North American Menopause Society called NAMS um, just came out with their 2022 guidelines in hormone Absolutely. replacement therapy. And they are, every time they come out with a new guideline, and if you know medicine, guidelines are pretty conservative, right? Guidelines are never gonna be your like cutting edge, everyone should do this, this helps everyone. But over the years, since some of the damaging studies that turned out to be kind of BS uh, came out over the years, the, the North American Menopause Society have gotten more and more confident in saying, hey guys, hormones are not all bad and not all good. 
right? There is nuance here. They are really good for helping people in early menopause who have hot flashes and night sweats. They're really good for preventing osteoporosis and they are really good for preventing genitourinary syndrome of menopause. So hormones are really important for many, many people and we are underusing them. Uh, and, the, and so they are coming out with a lot of really good evidence-based information, but there's not enough marketing and advocacy to get the word out and not enough doctors who are trained, this is a real problem, right? There are not enough doctors trained in how to do it. That's a big issue because just because someone says, oh yeah, hormones, they're not so bad anymore. If they don't know the difference between a patch and a pill and a gel and a, a, the different kinds of progestin, you know, it's a big problem. Um, and so we have to do more training of, of uh, providers. Yeah, well, that may actually change uh, in the future here when it comes to advocacy and mobilization. Um, I know many urologists and doctors out there don't, don't quite believe or support or are behind 100% um, on compounding pharmacies, obviously, because, you know, a lot of them have been in operation for many years. There was a huge issue with meningitis, and one of them in Massachusetts uh, killed a bunch of people. So obviously, there was some quality control issues in that case. But um, we, we are really, and I work a lot with all kinds of hormone clinics and doctors and products, both pharmaceuticals and not, and comp compounded. And we, uh, we are very concerned that the FDA may actually shut down 11 hormones uh, that are co currently compounded, and they've been compounded for like 20, 30 years. So um, that I'm, I see that as probably, and we hope it doesn't happen, but chances are probably will. They, they spend a lot of money on a big old book a review on the whole industry um, called NASM. Anyways, so um, I think that's what's coming here. People are going to, uh, women are already saying, where do I sign? Where do I show up? Uh, well, so it's a, it's a big problem, right? So uh, compounding pharmacies have their role and I use compounding products when I really don't have FDA approved options. And, and there are uh, certain things where I will use compounded products. But Again, in the sense of it's not all or nothing, good or bad, you know, black and white. And as, if you ever have, you know, someone coming to do legislation, it's all, always going to be, okay, this is how I feel. Abortion is good or bad, you know, right or wrong, yes or no. It has to be binary. And we have turned hormones into a binary conversation, which is insane because it's, it's an absolutely insane, right? So I'll give you a perfect example, right? You have transgender patients who come in and want gender affirming hormones and every endocrinologist, most endocrinologists are like, yes, let's give you all of these gender affirming hormones because you deserve to be you, okay? When does Caitlyn Jenner go off her estrogen therapy, right? Caitlyn Jenner is like 73 years old. When is she gonna go off her hormone therapy? She's not, right? She deserves her estrogen therapy because she deserves to feel the way she wants to feel. So why do we tell every woman over the age of 50 that it's too dangerous for them to even consider hormone therapy? They can't, they must have an estrogen of zero and have brittle bones and urinary tract infections and no libidos and painful intercourse and hot flashes and night sweats. They just have to suffer because it's too dangerous. What? That doesn't make any sense, right? I've given lectures to endocrinology departments because they didn't understand menopause and they feel very confident doing transgender hormone therapy. So it, it's so backwards, right? And so with compound products, I have a big issue with, and again, I don't know, I don't actually know much about what you're for or against, so I will just say it here. I have a big problem with the pellet industry, you know, because they are not researching what they're doing. There's, they're do, there's no oversight in their products. There is no, you know, there's no regulating body. And so we're implanting, and you could tell me, oh, well, this company's legitimate. They know what they're doing, but nobody can actually tell me that that's true. And so the problem is, is if they're making a bajillion dollars from their pellets, show up and do the clinical trials. There is an FDA approved testosterone pellet that did the work. Do the work, do the work and show me that pellet therapy for women is, is safe, is effective and it works fine and get that and get that oversight and just do it, right? But because until they do that, I can't put my gold star of approval on it, you know, no matter what people tell me. Does that make sense? No, no, so yeah, I mean, I'm not I afraid love, of I, So I'm not afraid of compound and I love compound in pharmacies when they're appropriate, but too often I think providers sell patients on compounded products because they say, oh, well, the FDA approved stuff is not legitimate when the FDA approved stuff is bioidentical, right? Which is a marketing scheme, right? By estradiol 
is estradiol, is estradiol, there's lots of estradiol products that are bioidentical that are FDA approved. All testosterone is bioidentical, right? All testosterone products, whether they're compounded or one of the gajillion FDA approved products we have for men are all bioidentical products. Does that make sense? I, I, yeah, 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 I yeah, know yeah, people, no. people listening are gonna bring out their tomatoes and throw them at the computer, no, but- no. Um, I think any long acting, I call it long acting agent, like a pellet, um, I, have, I have my reservations anyway, so I can go on forever on that. So no, that's, that's really not the best example for me on company, most like creams and suppositories for vaginal estrogen, like, you, you know, you talk absolutely, about absolutely. You know, there are reasons yeah, to do, yeah. to do it, you know, and, and we need more affordable products, right? Is why is Viagra, right? $7 for 90 pills, right? You can, if you go to Mark Cuban's pharmacy on cost plus drugs and you have your your, your uh, doctor write a prescription for Viagra or Cialis, you can get 90 pills for like $7, right? Super cheap. Why is vaginal estrogen, you know, $44 a month still? It's been out since the seventies. It's generic. Like why is the, even the generic company charging so much money for it? And that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of with our advocacy is how can we, you know, if people, People don't have access to these life-saving products, right? They're going to get into the hospital with a urinary tract infection that tries to kill them, as opposed to being on the preventative therapy that they need to to have a healthy microbiome of their, you know, vaginal tissue. A hundred percent behind all this, and I hope you give me the, and I'm going to let it, you go now that you gave me the chance to do a few other videos because we can talk forever, as you can tell. I would love it. And I would love, you know, I think what's so fun is, is mixing in these videos with, we talk about both genders because I think too often, you know, it starts in sex ed. You separate the boys and the girls and the girls learn about periods and the boys learn about God knows what, right? I didn't go to those, those, those courses, but there needs to be more under, I need men to be really pissed off uh, about hormones in women. I need it, right? I need them to understand because they can't just keep getting divorced and marrying younger women. Like it's not sustainable. It's very expensive to get divorced, right? And so it, it, it's, right? so we have to all understand this. And you have to understand that at late forties, early fifties, shit's about to get weird, right? And the person is literally going to transform and it's not a fun process. And they're being gaslit by their doctors to tell them, oh, here's an antidepressant and a calcium pill. That doesn't make any sense, right? And so, but there's also other people saying, oh, we need to use all of these, you know, uh, uh, very expensive treatments. And my answer is it doesn't have to be that expensive. It doesn't have to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, always compounded products. Like there are really, um, uh, you know, more uh, easier ways and even insurance covered ways to do things. Good. Thank you so much for your time today. Tell us uh, how, uh, how can people follow you or even about your clinic, if that's okay. I know your book. Absolutely. Uh, no, no, no. I would love patience. I would love taking care of people. I would love, uh, my goal is to get to 10,000 Instagram followers. I'm at like 9,020. Uh, so you gotta, you gotta help me now. So you can find me at DR Rachel Rubin. Uh, that's my handle on, we have a great Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter presence. Um, I would love for people to follow and tell us what content they want to see. Cause the more you talk to me and tell me, the more we can put out there. We also have a newsletter that I'm trying to get out weekly at rachelrubinmd.com. So rachelrubinmd.com, sign up for the weekly newsletter. As I said, we're just getting started people these gray hairs I still got a lot more gray hairs to get uh, and so we are just getting started and uh, the more you yell and scream the more we can do together because we really need there's so much work to be done thank you so much you are the most frank I've done interviews for 30 years and you're the most fun and the most frank because you are frank you're telling us it is of anybody else so I appreciate it I hope to see you in many other interviews because we I'm sure I'm gonna get hit with all kinds of questions from both genders. Um, so thank you so much and have a great vacation, okay? Thanks everybody, thanks for having me, Nelson. Bye-bye.